so excited to connect with you. Oh, and look at that. All right. <laughs> hey. Hey, so excited to have you. Uh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm, I've been excited for this uh, for several weeks now, ever since we first talked about it. So. Perfect. So before we connect with that, I do want to take a second. And if you're just joining us, uh, this is Journey to Social Entrepreneurship, where we're talking about the relationship between national service or just a term of service and creating your own business. Um, it's brought to you by NGS Movement. And that was Anna, who just started out for us, and Positive Impact Podcast, which is me. And thanks to all of our partners, the Franklin Institute, no, the Aspen Institute Franklin Project, Service Year, Blab, and Ashoka U. And with that, Josh, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I am the Chief Inspiration Officer at Social Change Nation, <laughs> uh, which is, is my latest project. Been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, prior to that, like I mentioned in the chat now, I'm a proud resident of Kansas City, Missouri. I grew up in a tiny town in central Kansas. But prior to that, I did a, a lot of social justice work, started that all uh, just fresh out of high school, did City Year in Cleveland uh, way back in 2003, uh, laid a foundation really for everything I've done since, um, went to college, worked a lot with my community service office, um, then pursued a career in a lot of nonprofit organizations and, and a purpose-driven uh, for-profit as well. Uh, Alex, you're familiar with the Dave Ramsey show. That was where I worked for a few years. <laughs> just um, a little bit. Yeah, just, just a little, little bit. bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that, that really shaped uh, my city. It really shaped my journey. And like I always said, laid the foundation for everything that I've done since. It just it wove a thread through uh, everything that has come in my life. And it's really all of those experiences put together that shape what I do at Social Change Nation, where I just get about the business of helping people start in social entrepreneurship. Well, you are just such a great guest for this because this is really what it's all about. We're taking a whole bunch of people who really want to be impactful change makers and giving them both the inspiration, showing them a different models, and hopefully giving them the tools to start. But before we get there, I really want to dig into City Year. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar with Peace Corps. I obviously am an AmeriCorps alum, so I understand that. But City Year's new. What is that program? What are kind of their goals? And what was your role? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so City Year is actually a fairly different animal now uh, than when I was there. Uh, now they're focused exclusively in schools, um, doing tutoring programs. And we, we did that back in, in my day, too, but we did a lot of other things. So City Year uh, actually predated AmeriCorps. And then eventually, when Clinton saw it, it was what really inspired him to start AmeriCorps. And then City Year came under the AmeriCorps umbrella uh, shortly after that. But because of that, they really combined a lot of things that a lot of different AmeriCorps programs did. Um, so we had, out of my core group of 40 people, we had some small groups working with Habitat for Humanity, some small groups working at a hospice, some small groups working at schools. And so just really running the gamut of service uh, is, is what they did back then. Which for me was great because here I am, this kid from this tiny town in Kansas, just thrown into Cleveland, Ohio, and just ex was exposed to so many things. My role uh, was actually to help with our Friday and Saturday service when we would literally volunteer at any nonprofit that needed us. So I'd go wow. and seek out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when I first got there, it was just, you know, we would literally, anyone who called, uh, but they put me in a role with one other core member to bring some organization to that and have some some clarity to it. So we had some themes for our service each month, and then we'd really go out and be a little more proactive about the nonprofits we worked with. And then on Fridays and Saturdays, it was, you know, maybe 10 core members would go to this one, 10 core members would go to that one. But in that role, I got to interact with volunteer coordinators at all of these nonprofits and got exposed to the great work that so many of them were doing. And so for me, this 18 year old kid, it was an amazing opportunity and responsibility. I mean, I mean, you're overseeing programs, you're coordinating, you're working with nonprofits. I mean, a man of many hats. I, I was, yeah. And I, I got thrown into the fire right away and, uh, you know, took a crash course in a lot of things. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we made a really solid impact and, and created some really great relationships. And I, I learned a ton about keeping things like that organized and all the different opportunities that were out there, which like I said, for me, 18 years old, not really knowing exactly what I wanted to do, but knowing that I wanted to serve somehow, it was really, really great getting that exposure. And so, like I said, though, that's, that's <laughs> the old city year, uh, city year nowadays, they really focus exclusively on schools, which at the end of the day, in terms of impact for them, they just really found that was their, their best area. And that's where they, they focus and, and really make the strongest impact. And now there's other programs that help fill some of those other needs. A absolutely. Um, yeah. With AmeriCorps, I was in Campus Compact, and I had a team of AmeriCorps individuals who worked with different nonprofits. 
Um, but one of the points I wanted to make is all these different organizational skills. I'm sure that never comes in handy with starting a podcast, a business, <laughs> and all these other things that you have going on. Um, and can we also say that you are getting married this yes, year? I, I am. And there's no organization in a wedding. I mean, it just all comes together naturally, right? No, none, none whatsoever. And, and my fiance can vouch for that too, because we're not doing any of that right now. Right? It's not crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And get married to a fellow social entrepreneur, actually. She runs a, a purpose-driven hospital here in Kansas City. And so, you know, amazing how, how things connect. Oh, cool. One of the things that you wanted to touch on today, and before we really dive into all that social entrepreneurs and that we're going to talk, and we're going to talk a little bit about this crazy thing we call podcasting. Sounds good. But you wanted to touch on the role of service in a traditional career path, that while we're talking about social entrepreneurs and that it's great for them, especially for those individuals who are thinking about social entrepreneurism, but who it might not be for them, what role does service have in a traditional career path? Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate you asking me that, Alex. And the reason I suggested that as a topic is because as I interact with a lot of people who want to get into this space and, and I write a lot of articles on it and, and, and do podcasts, there's a lot of excitement around it. And just with millennials in general, there's a big excitement around entrepreneurship. I mean, we've seen people in our generation, you know, the, the Facebooks, the Twitters, we've seen them just take off and have this massive success with entrepreneurship. So overnight success. Yeah, exactly. Which <laughs> it's usually a story that we're fed. Yeah, yeah. It takes about 10 years to become an overnight success, by the way, at least, you know. And, and so anyway, we, we have this excitement and this energy around entrepreneurship. And I think so much so that that sometimes people feel this this. I don't know, this pressure, this expectation that if you're a millennial, you got to be going after that because that's what everyone does. When you got to have 30 startups by the time you're 30. And then that way, they're, they're all going to be overnight successes and you'll be on that billionaire chart and you can document where you were. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you on Shark Tank or something like that. Right. Yeah. And and so there's there's this, I think, almost unrealistic expectation around that. And and entrepreneurship is great and it's an amazing thing, but it's it's not the fit for everyone. And that's okay. And so I think one thing that I, I really encourage people to do from, from that standpoint is to think about ways that you can take service and apply it to a, a current position. And so the term for this is intrapreneurship, which is, I you know, love that term. yeah, it's, it's a great term. Um, so you're, you're working at a place and they have some kind of corporate social responsibility initiative that they want to take on or a nonprofit that they want to partner with. Anything along those lines, these are opportunities that are really, really popping up all over the world um, in, in a, a lot of different industries. So I, I'll give you an example of that. An organization I worked with here in Kansas City, very profitable company, working with a lot of residential real estate investors, but they have a very big community heart. And so they have built out a big partnership with uh, some Habitat for Humanity affiliates. And so they've had someone on the team that's running that and building those partnerships who really loved Habitat and volunteered with them for quite a while. But that person has stayed in their position with their company, has gotten the chance to be creative, be a social intrapreneur, and uh, <laughs> really find some opportunities. And a lot of companies want to get in on that because millennials are really demanding that out of the companies that they do business with. And it's so important. I really do want to emphasize the fact it can be so unexpected. Um, I'm going to give a quick example. I was actually recently contacted by the Philadelphia Eagles. And apparently within the football team, the NFL football team, they have an entire division dedicated to social entrepreneurship, or not to social entrepreneurship, but to corporate responsibility. And so people who are working for the football team, they're actually, their entire role is capacity building and nonprofits. And it was just, it was so cool. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Great. All right, so now I'd love to get some feedback from the audience. And this is, I'm assuming if you're on Blab with us today, you're going to be pretty savvy. But I'd love to know how many of you guys are podcast listeners. And so if you guys just type in, if you're, it's on the left-hand column. Um, not many of you guys are using it tonight, but there, it is a chat feature. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you guys listen to podcasts, if your favorite podcast, I know it's obviously Social Change Nation and the Positive Impact Podcast, of course. But if there's some other ones, um, we'd love to hear from you guys. But with that, how do you take this role? Um, you know, you're learning these organizational skills, you're getting connected to business. And how do you change, turn that into Social Change Nation? Well, Social Change Nation really began uh, from a research project that I was doing where I was interviewing a lot of startup social entrepreneurs for a graduate thesis. 
And as I was doing these interviews, what I was finding was that business, social entrepreneurship, social businesses, that was really becoming business as usual. It was shifting the way that business was done. And it was a story that really needed to be told. Uh, and then I had that background with Dave Ramsey, where I was familiar with a lot of online media and podcasts. And a lot of times, you know, these, writing a thesis is very important. But I, I think that message doesn't always reach as many people as it could or should. And a podcast is really a great way to get a message out there. And again, this was just a story that needed to be told. And, and I knew it was a, a way that people could access and, and really learn some lessons and get started in social entrepreneurship. Great. I love that you're really talking and focusing on the storytelling component and that there were so many stories to tell. I'm very curious, especially coming from this little bit of a media background, what is the role of storytelling in social entrepreneurship? I think it's it's really the backbone of social entrepreneurship. Uh, what I always say to a startup social entrepreneurship or st startup social entrepreneur is social entrepreneurs start with why. You know, if if you're starting a company or a movement, uh, you really have to have a central something that's central to your heart for why you're doing that, um, and that's really your story. So for me, it's it's AmeriCorps, the people that impacted me. There was a student in particular that I really felt like I had a big impact on and really changed the way that I viewed things. Again, I'm, I'm this small town kid from Kansas. You know, I didn't know what, what kids in the inner city faced and, and he really showed me a lot about that. Uh, we developed a strong relationship. So that's really where my story began. And, and it's a very personal story for me. And so having some story that's really central to who you are that you weave then into your brand is, is really, really critical. And, and you'll see this I think with, with the best social entrepreneurs companies. So a big example of this for me is Mission Belt uh, is a great company. They have a story of going down to Central America where they helped uh, launch some entrepreneurs there through Kiva. And then that was really impactful to them. So that's why Kiva is their cause-based partner for their company. Cool. Great. Um, we are getting some examples. I'm glad that all of our audience is starting to get involved in the chat feature. If you guys have companies that you feel really tell their story well, I'd love to hear them and then we can kind of bring them in. Um, and I had another question. <laughs> so storytelling, um, I know that you within your business, that you are actually kind of pivoting and that you're working to dive deeper into the storytelling component. Can you tell us what you have on the horizon for 2016? Yeah. So in the past, my podcast, the Voices of Social Change podcast was all about interviewing established social entrepreneurs, asking the same set of questions. So you get a different set of lessons, but around the same topics every time you'd listen in. A little cookie cutter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, I, you know, it was, it was great. And I think from, you know, a teaching standpoint was, was really important. Um, but again, people relate to stories at my heart. I'm a storyteller. And that's really what, what resonates. And so what I'm shifting into is a podcast now that will tell the story of just one social venture at a time um, over the course of about nine episodes or so. And so each episode you could tune in and you could get a standalone lesson, but there's going to be a thread connecting every episode. And so for the first one I'm going to do, it's actually about our hostel here in Kansas City and about how we started small and, and tried to grow that. And you know, we didn't have investment. We weren't going to take on debt, different things like that. And so we had to find some very creative ways of- What? That. You worked for Dave Ramsey. <laughs> now you don't want to take on debt? I know. Imagine that. <laughs> and so we learned a lot along the way. And we've had some really incredible guests coming through the hostel. So it'll really be about telling that story, having their voices in there. But every time you tune in, you get some kind of practical value. Um, like I think when people hear that, hey, we, we started this hostel without debt or investment, it's like, how, how do you do that? And, and so giving some practical steps along the way is always something that's important to us. But if you can tell a story and bring people emotionally in to what you're doing in a genuine and authentic way, I think it's a really, really powerful way to build any business. Uh, Hannah asked, what is the name of your hostel? Uh, it's just Hostel Casey. <laughs> it makes it easy. Great search. I do digital marketing in my day job. So great SEO, right? <laughs> right, exactly. So you're talking about telling the story and that by telling the story, people are much able or they're really able to connect with you. What role does community and building that community around the story play, particularly in your businesses? It's uh, absolutely vital. I, I think any more, any kind of a business you're, you're building, a phrase I like is you're building a community of customers. And now that's, that's more of a for-profit business standpoint, but either way, whether it's a nonprofit, whatever you're trying to launch, you're building a community of stakeholders, a community of people who know, like, and trust you. They're bought into your mission and they want to be a part of it because they believe in what you're doing. And you have to do that, I think, no matter what you're doing. And, and there are lots of different ways to do that, uh, you know, via social media, email, in person. 
Um, but at the end of the day, podcast, you, podcast yeah, <laughs> but at the end of the day, community is, is just absolutely central because that's really the way people operate anymore. Now, one of the things, and I know I personally have struggled with this, and especially social entrepreneurs coming in today, there's so many different outlets to choose community. I mean, you got Facebook, you've got Blab, which of course we're all going to recommend Blab. You have podcasting, you have Periscope. There's probably three new out on the way. There's the Snapchat thing that I really don't know what it does, how it does it. What did you find? How did you determine which were the best outlets to build your community on? Yeah, well, the, the short answer to that question is this is going to be different for everyone, and it depends on what you're doing. Um, so, for example, sometimes, depending on your project, some, some kind of a live event, live speaking engagements, those kinds of things can be far more powerful than anything you might do online. But inevitably, you're going to have an online presence, I, I think, just in, in today's age. And so it, you're right. There are so many different platforms out there, and there's just no way you would really focus the right kind of energy on all of them. And so for us, it was really just a matter of testing. And then once we figured out the ones that worked, um, that, or the, the one or two that really worked, we just focused in on those. So for us, it happens to be Instagram and Twitter are really where we get the most response on, on social media. But we didn't really know that until we tried them all <laughs> a little bit for a few months. Now, when you're testing them out, what kind of results are you measuring against? How are you saying, yes, this is the one that it's worth committing our time? Engagement really is, is what I'm all about. Uh, so, you know, just to give you an example, likes on a Facebook page, uh, you can get a lot of likes on a Facebook page, but if no one's communicating, if no one's engaging with the content you're putting on there, I, the number of likes doesn't really do any good for you. So what I really measured in is, are people communicating? Are we helping them? Are they asking us questions and are we able to provide answers for them in a valuable way? And, uh, you know, the interesting thing about that is just if you're looking at all the social media platforms just generally, Instagram's engagement just beats the heck out of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and again, it depends on what you're doing because you have to have some pictures to go with it and that kind of thing. But, but it's interesting, you know, you, and that's been true for us. We've gotten great conversations going there. So for me, and I think for anyone really, find the, the avenue where you have a lot of engagement and, and go with that. So I think now is a great time to plug your Instagram handle. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, just at, at Social Change Nation. Great. Um, also, while we're doing plugs, this is a reminder for everyone watching. We do actually have a Facebook group for you to join where we want to continue the conversation. And so if you go to journeytosocialentrepreneurship.com and you join our email list, we are emailing that out. Uh, could you type in the plug? Yes, we will include that in the notes once Josh and I are done. Now, I want to go back to this hostel because obviously you're very invested in this hostel and um, it's Britain, right? Yes. Yeah. Britain's so Britain's your fiance. She runs it. Having worked with a lot of hostels before, I know some amazing stories come out of that. And I know it's going to be a little bit of a teaser for your upcoming season, but can you share one or two of the stories that are just really memorable of the hostel? Oh, absolutely. And I'm so glad you asked that, Alex, because I have two right top Perfect. of Perfect. Yeah. The first one, it's funny you mentioned this because I'm, I'm going to interview him in a few days to get some audio clips for the podcast. But one they're of our lively groups. Yeah. They're, they're awesome. So one of our favorite guests. Uh, and now he's a, he's a regular guest. He's been back several times. His name is Henry. And Henry is a full-blooded New Yorker. And, and every With the accent? Way, yes. Every way that you can imagine. Grew up in New York, has been in the city his whole life, you know, all, all of the above. Uh, New Yorker through and through. But for reasons that we don't really fully understand just yet, he is a diehard Kansas City Chiefs fan. Like, huh. Just, Has he been he, informed that New York has a couple teams? He, yeah, I think he knows that, but he, he loves the Kansas City Chiefs. And uh, so he'll come out here and, and go to lots of games. Um, and he's, he's just a great guy and uh, fits right in around here. And he's just, he's, he loves Kansas City too. And so he comes and stays with us all the time. Um, and it was really great when I was in New York. I actually visited him and his family runs some hotels around there. And so it was just a really, really awesome connection. You know, I was in New York anyway. We were able to meet up. It was really cool seeing the way they did things. Um, they, they actually have a lot of uh, connections down in Panama, uh, which is just really interesting for Britain and I because we love to travel a lot. And that's been true for a lot of our guests, by the way, as you know, they'll have connections all over the world. So yeah, I just saw Jason pop world. in with Viandu. Lots of traveling. I believe there we were mainly in Costa Rica and Rwanda yesterday, though. 
Okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Panama, but I think it was actually Costa Rica and Rwanda. Okay, Costa Rica. Yeah, another place I need to visit. Um, but so that that's that's I think a really really awesome story. But the second one is we'll say something about the things that uh, you stumble on in your business when you're not really planning for it. So we have a cat. His name is Walter. Oh, I've um, seen him on a video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's, he's, he's featured now all over the place. Now, Walter is, I, I'm convinced he's an alien from another planet because he's not like any cat I've ever seen. Um, he's, he's much more like a dog, really. He's like friendly beyond belief. Um, and so when people come, I mean, he's running up, he's greeting them. He'll like, he'll fall asleep on them. Um, he'll let you pet him. He'll let you, you know, spin around. On he does not care. Like he is just the friendliest, cutest cat in the world. I'm, I'm pretty convinced. The dog cat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And anyway, you know, so we, we've had that cat and early on as he was, you know, cause he's greeting all these people when we're away and stuff like that. And everyone loves him. Every, honestly, the comments around the hostel centered a lot more on Walter than they did on us and our hospitality. So, <laughs> gotta love all that effort you're putting in to make it a great experience. Oh, all we had to do was put the cat in there and we got great reviews. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, so, you know, he's, he's just our cat and people all of a sudden started leaving comments on it and we hadn't really planned on this, but we went ahead and just turned Walter into our ambassador of happiness is what we call him. Uh, <laughs> we have a little, little, painted graphic of Walter that is featured in all of our branding. We have t-shirts with Walter's logo on them that says, you know, the ambassador of happiness. He's featured on our, on our hostel page. So he's does he have his own like about us section, Walter, the ambassador. I, of happiness. I, I think he does. And if he doesn't, uh, I'm going to make sure he gets that ASAP because he needs it. And he, he puts in a lot of work at the hostel. He does have um, a lot of guests to greet. Exactly. And he never seems to get tired of it. So it works out. <laughs> But but again, he just kind of accidentally became a part of our brand. Uh, but be open to those things because you can plan so much, but inevitably the things that I think are the best things are the ones that you just stumble on. Um, so a reminder, the hostel is actually in, it was in KC, right? Kansas City. Yep. Kansas, Kansas City. City. Perfect. Uh, well, that comes, I love that you do that. And it's just embracing the change. And it's also about being aware of what's going on you had to actually look at the reviews and see those trends to make the difference and say, oh, Walter is becoming a little bit of an icon in our hostel. So apparently yeah. it was his hostel. <laughs> um, and kind of bringing this back to service, were there, were there times during your term of service that you had to kind of survey the landscape, see what was going on and pivot? Yeah, big time. Uh, so that, you know, I mentioned that I came in to manage that Friday and Saturday service. Uh, that was really what that was, was all about. You know, when I, when I first got there, sometimes we wouldn't know where we were going until about five minutes before we went there because it just hadn't been figured out. Life and, of nonprofits. Yeah, exactly. Occasionally, yeah. Yeah. And so it was something that was, was clearly not working and we needed to find a better way. And, you know, I don't know what came over me. Maybe I was just an ignorant, not ignorant, but just an uninformed 18 year old and just believed I could do anything. And, you know, so I saw that problem and I was like, hey, I want to come in there and try to fix it. <laughs> and uh, it worked out really well in the end, but I didn't know exactly what I was in for. Uh, but I think just, you know, being ready to step up, especially when you feel pulled to, to make a difference and to make a change in something, just being willing to step up and take it on and, and do what it takes uh, is, is, is a big part of it. But that was definitely a big pivot for us there. Cool. Do you have one skill that was really essential for growing this business that you learned in service, but you didn't learn in school? Yeah, just time management and, and how to prioritize. Uh, you know, I, I mean, high school I, I wasn't always the easiest thing for me, but, but I definitely, I didn't have to be really great about prioritizing or, well, I just wasn't very good about prioritizing and time management. My grades showed that probably <laughs> is more of the truth, but, but city year really forced me to think about how to manage my time because I really fell in love with the opportunity of, of just getting to know a lot of different uh, civic engagement opportunities in the city, a lot of different nonprofits. And in order to do all of that and make time for that, I really had to plan my days and I had to, to make lists of, you know, what were the things that I had to get done first thing in the morning so that I could get to all these other things and I think just the skills around organization were big, but I would say even bigger than that was just, I completely got over my fear of approaching people and, and breaking into new circles and networking and just putting myself out there. 
That and one's kind of big for starting a business, much less huge. a podcast. Yeah, it's it's huge, and and you know you're you're gonna go out there and you're gonna get your nose bloodied a few times, and you'll learn a lot from it, and you recover. But if you don't go out there and take that chance, you're never gonna know, and you're never gonna learn, and you're never gonna grow. Oh, such a great reminder that we do. We have to put ourselves out there, whether it's as social entrepreneurs, whether it's just as change makers. And hopefully we're not getting bloodied every time, Right, <laughs> but to be willing that. to trip and to stumble and then learn, grow and move forward. So without that really essential skill, do you, without your term of service, where do you think you would be today? Oh man. Uh, I know that was kind of a big one I just threw. Yeah. I, I mean, it sounds cliche, but honestly, I don't even really want to imagine where I would be. I can't imagine where I would be because I really mean it when I say my service year was the foundation that I laid everything else on. If, if I hadn't had that, uh, I, I would have gone to college with a completely different mentality and not ready to take advantage of things in the way that I did. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to go and start my company and face fears in the way that I did. I wouldn't have been able to, I mean, even working with Dave Ramsey, I just kind of came there, started as an intern and hoped that things would work out and they ended up working out. But, you know, I had that that mindset of just putting myself out there. And uh, yeah, if, if, if I hadn't had AmeriCorps, I wouldn't have had any of that. So I really don't think I would have uh, any, anything that I have today. I, I wouldn't have if I hadn't had that. Have my service this makes you feel better. I asked Kyle that yesterday and he said, I probably would still be sitting right here because <laughs> he was physically in New York at his home. But um, there was a backstory. So props gotcha. for that. It wasn't yeah. quite, oh, I'd still be here. <laughs> um, at this time, I've been having so much fun with Josh that I forgot to ask for our audience questions. So if you guys have questions, I'd love to hear them. Uh, if you, it's the forward slash button with a Q. Um, I'm really terrible at it, but I'm sure somebody will demonstrate it. I was doing it all wrong the last two days. But if you guys have questions, both now for this session and throughout the entire event, we'd love to hear them. Uh, so as we're kind of wrapping up, what advice do you have for someone who's very early in their journey towards becoming an impactful change maker? What do you have to say to them? Well, I think that the first thing you, you want to do is, and we talked about this earlier, don't, don't get caught up in the hype of everyone wanting to be an entrepreneur or having the next big startup. You need to find out what is the best fit for you. And if it is entrepreneurship, go for it and live your dream. But if, if it is making an impact at the company you're currently at, or if it's making an impact at another company that is, is socially conscious, uh, do that. So I think the first thing you want to do is, is you do want to find out, you know, what is, what is the fit for you and what is the strongest way for you to make impact. And once you figure that out, don't be afraid to just get out there and, and network and, and find the circles, find the groups of people that are, are interested in the things that you're interested in. So I'll give you an example for me. I, I was a grad student at KU. I, I didn't have, I, you know, I'd started these little companies in college and that kind of thing. So I kind of had the entrepreneurial bug, but I didn't have a huge background in entrepreneurship. But I got myself into what's called the Kansas City Startup Village, which is a small, in about a 10 block area, there are like 30 startups. They all came around Google Fiber. And I just put myself next to a bunch of startups. And I went to all these startup networking groups and these entrepreneurship networking groups that I got to know because I was in that village and I got to know all those events. And I was just going to them all and just got to know a lot of the people very quickly. And when I was working in the startup village, I mean, I knew the content, but I didn't know anything about the web tech stuff and so many other things about business. But I was never more than a few blocks away from someone who did. And it's a really helpful community. And so that worked really well for me because startups, that was, that was the fit. But whatever the fit is for you, find yourself a way to get into groups like that so you can be surrounded with people who will help you, who will lift you up, and will continue to help you grow in whatever area you're, you're wanting to grow in to, to live your dreams and, and make, make the difference that you're wanting to make in the world. Really driving home the community aspect. I absolutely yeah. <laughs> love it. <laughs> and let's also mention, especially if you are currently in a role and you're not sure what might be a fit for you. I mean, this entire event is all about service. Go start out, go volunteering. I mean, maybe it's not taking two years off and going and doing Peace Corps. Maybe it's just going down the street, serving at your local um serving at your local homeless shelter, serving, you know, food, giving out, finding causes that you're connected to and seeing what resonates with you. Yeah, totally. And thanks for that, Alex, because you're exactly right. And that was, like I said, at City Year, it was the fact that I was able to service so many organizations that helped me really zero in on what I wanted to focus on. 
Josh, you have been absolutely incredible. I hope you stick around with us for a couple minutes and share all of your um, plugs for your social media. I know people want to have your Instagram handle and they can connect with you. And with that, I think we're actually going to switch back to Anna. But thank you so much for joining. Sounds good. Thank and you, Portia, Alex. Thank you.